Hey, this is Stereo Police. Back. This time with a technical discussion or a video on a topic. I'm not reviewing a particular component today. I'm still in the process of uh, finalizing my my video on the R9, the Yamaha R9 receiver. I'm listening to it right now, coming up, uh, forming impressions of its sound, and uh, I'm not finished with that yet, so I still have to do the final part of that video, but uh, in the meantime, I wanted to get around to a topic that <clears throat> I've been wanting to make a video about this topic uh, for years, and I just never really got around to it. And so I had a little time today, just a little bit, and I threw together some notes from different sources. And of course, I'm going to add uh, add my own stuff to it as I go. I don't. Uh, I've got uh, some. I made a PowerPoint presentation that you're looking at. I printed it out and uh, don't have a script that goes with it. I'm just going to talk up uh, each one of these uh, each one of these slides as we go. But the topic is <clears throat> something that I consider to be fairly important uh, in uh, in high end audio and audio in general, but particularly high end audio. Those of us who care uh, about how things sound, those of us who care about our equipment and uh, uh, and get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Uh, and that topic is really three things, but <clears throat> it's all about the damping factor. Um, but I've titled this presentation Output Impedance, Damping Factor, and Speaker Cables because they're all intertwined. They really, they're all one. And, and that'll become clear as I go through this presentation. And by the way, I think I believe this presentation will probably be broken up into three parts because <clears throat> I like to have each one of roughly a half an hour. Um, and uh, so this one would probably be an hour and a half total, depending on what I do at the end. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to actually do some real experiments on some equipment or not. I haven't figured that out yet, but roughly about an hour and a half. And I think if you pay attention to this, maybe go back and watch it a couple times. And by the way, this presentation is geared towards the average person. It's not geared towards the engineer, or the scientist, or the uh, total, utter, and complete geek that likes to go on to forums and uh, spout off about how smart they are. Um, that's why I avoid I avoid a lot of these audio forums. I just don't like getting into pissing matches with uh, people who think they know what they're talking about. Most of them don't. Some do. Uh, most of them are Wikipedia educated. I can spot those people right off the bat. Um, anyway, this is geared towards the average person. There's a, some simple math I'm going to do in here, but if you really pay attention from beginning to end, uh, <clears throat> I think this is a topic that's really interesting and it's it's uh, it's fairly important. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> output impedance, damping factor, and speaker cables. Speaker wire, speaker cables, whatever. Um, every power amplifier has an output impedance, and we typically draw that. Uh, we we uh, draw a, sort of a block diagram of an amplifier or just a, a source. We draw it as a voltage with some source impedance, and then connected out here is the load and that load will be our speaker many times 8 ohms and the amplifier is basically uh, we can visualize it as a voltage source with an inline resistance and that resistance becomes important to damping factor also all speaker cables have a resistance so if you want to talk about speaker cables there's a positive and a negative cable right here and that is essentially an inline resistor depending on the gauge of your cable and how long the run is the resistance is going to be proportional to the the thickness or the diameter or the gauge of the cable um, and uh, um, proportional to the run how long it is 
So the larger the cable, the larger the diameter, the lower the resistance, the longer the run, the higher the resistance. And the damping factor of your system. Now most people think that damping factor is just the spec that uh, is a characteristic of the amplifier. Uh, and it is to some extent. However, however, what happens is these speaker cables, it really damping factor when you hook it up, when you hook your amp up to your speaker cables to your speaker, damping factor changes from the spec that's given to you um, by the manufacturer. Um, it changes. It becomes a system-wide damping factor and it changes because this RS has to be added to the resistance of your speaker cables. So it effectively your speaker cables effectively change the output impedance of your amplifier which changes the damping factor. We'll get to that. And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, long runs of speaker wire or wires that are too small in diameter, a uh, high gauge, can just kill your damping factor of your overall system. Um, and when you kill your damping factor, you kill your amp's ability to control bass. You also, you alter the frequency response of your system. And I'll, I'll talk about that last. So, two reasons why, why you want low output impedance or high damping factor of, uh, of your amplifier plus a low speaker wire resistance is one, it keeps the damping factor low. Okay, you, you can't control the output impedance or the damping factor of your amp. That's a characteristic of the amp, right? And typically with transistor amps, they're very good. They're 50 plus. The, um, doing this from memory, the A1000 amp that I've been toying with that I love has a damping factor, I believe, of 40. The AS1100 has a damping factor of 250. Both of those are acceptable, really. Um, I'll get to this in another slide, but typically you want 50 plus to be a decent, decent damping factor. So you can't control it. That's a, that's a characteristic of your amp, but you can control your speaker wire. You can control the resistance of your speaker wire. Um, and again, you can control it by the gauge of it as well as how long the run is. You want that run to be as short as possible, no doubt. So number one, keeping the damping factor low. And number two, a high output impedance, which includes if you have crappy speaker wire, can change the frequency response of your amp speaker combination. can dramatically alter it. And I'm going to give you uh, some examples of that uh, towards the end. So let's get into damping factor. Um, I have uh, popped a couple of uh, bullet points here, and here's my source. This is a good source uh, to visit. Um, let me zoom in on that a little bit. Hopefully you can read it. Um, it's a good website talking, talking about damping factor. There's many many good websites about it, many good sites to go to to learn about it, and as well as text, textbooks too. I have a lot of textbooks, but... Um, so, damping factor uh, indicates an amp's ability to control your speakers. It becomes exceedingly important uh, uh, for low frequencies. Uh, damping factor has little little effect on uh, controlling your you know your mid ranges or your tweeters. It, it's it's a, the ability to con con to control your woofers. Um, I think I'm I'm going to jump ahead and talk about something, but I'll wait till I get to that slide. Um, okay, well there's the slide. Um, this is kind of small text, but basically, so the damping factor of your amp. Um, and let me just draw this here as we go. Uh, your amp has an, uh, an output impedance. I'm going to call it Z out. Um, and damping factor is inversely proportional to the output and impedance. So if output impedance is low, damping factor will be high. Okay. Now, 
a speaker. And I'm, what I'm getting uh, at here is how or why does output impedance or damping factor uh, have the ability to control cone motion of a speaker, particularly in the bass frequencies? Well, a speaker is basically a moving mass. The mass is going to be the cone and the dust cap and even the voice coil. And it's a moving mass on a spring, and the spring is the surround as well as the spider. The spider down in here, those are the springs. So you, what you have is a spring with a weight on it that's attached to some point. And as you know, if you have a spring with a weight on it, if you pull the weight down and release it, it's going to oscillate and then come to a rest. And whether or not, uh, depending on how well that spring mass combination is damped, will determine how much it oscillates. So if, if you have some kind of a shock absorber right here, Okay, this gets into car suspensions, but it's the same thing. It says identical on a car suspension. Identical. You've got a wheel, you've got a spring, you've got a shock absorber. If you have a shock absorber that damps those oscillations, then you'll end up with, you know, when you pull this down and let it go, you'll end up with a little bump, and then... I probably drew it wrong. It's probably backwards, but... No, nah, it's okay. A little bump, and then it comes to a nice rest without any ringing. That is nice and damped. That is underdamped. Lots of ringing. Okay? Same thing with the speaker cone. It moves. Now, it's hard to see, but it does happen on a very small level when you tap it and release it. This is an old old speaker I used to, for a magnet to magnetize my uh, screwdrivers, by the way. I'm not destroying something good. It's the same thing, right? So you're going to get some ringing right here and some oscillations. And when that happens, a speaker I'm going to draw uh, a speaker is basically a coil riding through a magnetic field, um, and when you know the way you you, you draw a voice coil, I'm drawing a cross section right here, right? A voice coil. These are basically coiled around like that, right? And then there's a magnetic field around it, like that, right? So there's a magnetic field going through the coil. And anytime you have a magnetic field going through a coil <clears throat> and you move that coil, it, it becomes a generator of electricity. So when you get a nice kick to the speaker, okay, like, like a kick drum, let's say, the amp will cause, uh, the speaker is a motor at that point, and the amp will uh, provide a voltage that moves that cone out. But when that cone comes back to a rest, it becomes a generator because it itself is moving because the spring itself is pulling it back the suspension is pulling it back and then it becomes a generator and that generator sends electricity back to the amplifier in the other direction right? back to the amp and that current going back to the amp needs to be damped it needs to be damped so it doesn't ring and the damping depends on the output impedance plus your speaker cable combination that we're going to get to. Um, and that damping, your, your, your uh, low output impedance plus your preferably low speaker cable resistance becomes the shock absorber. Um, so if you had a super high output impedance or a ridiculously long cable run with uh, speakers that are, you know, two ohm speaker wires, you know, a two ohm run, then you become basically this system here without the shock absorber and you get all kinds of overshoot and ring in your speaker cone and you have what's called muddy, sloppy, poorly resolved bass. When you have a high damping factor coupled with the low resistance speaker cables you have this situation with a shock absorber and you know your speaker cone will move but it'll come right back to a rest where it needs to be waiting for the next um, portion of the signal to come along and you have nicely damped tight bass no mud, um, well resolved. <clears throat> so that's the need for um, a high damping factor and <clears throat> low resistance speaker cables. See, I'm going off the script here. I'm just doing this. <clears throat> just talking. I'm just discussing the physics of it. Okay. Now. 
Um, of course, modern solid-state amplifiers with uh, transistors and MOSFETs and BJTs and MOSFETs, transistors. Um, they, have, they use a lot of negative feedback. Uh, I won't get into this, but uh, they need a lot of negative feedback to get rid of the crappy characteristics of transistors as well as crossover distortion. But <clears throat> negative feedback has many benefits, and one of them is it reduces the output impedance. Um, and that's a desirable characteristic of negative feedback. So modern transistor amps typically have low output impedances and high damping factors on the order of 50 plus. Um, tube amplifiers <clears throat> don't have that advantage. <clears throat> they typically have output transformers, uh, the uh, plate resistance, uh, all of these factors that, that are involved in a design of a tube amplifier plus less negative feedback. <clears throat> result, <clears throat> excuse me, results in higher output impedance. So, <clears throat> pardon me, tube amplifiers um, typically have lower damping factors, higher output impedances, and hence, uh, as everyone knows, just about everyone knows, tube amplifiers cannot control bass nearly as well as uh, transistor amps. That's just because they have low damping factors and high output impedances by nature. So transistor amps are the kings of bass control. Tubes, now tubes have their benefits, of course, their sonic benefits, I love them. They sound great, but I haven't heard any tube amplifier in my life that can compete with a good solid state amp when it comes to amazing bass. I mean, bass clarity, resolution, accuracy, um, kick factor, the whole thing. Maybe there's some out there, I just haven't heard them. Okay, now, um, manufacturers measure, and this is an important, we're going to go through some math here and discuss some things, and then we're going to get into examples of what crappy speaker cables can do to your system. And it's actually astonishing. So this is worth going through. Um, manufacturers typically spec out damping factors as one of the uh, key specs of an amplifier along with total harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion, um, sometimes slew rate, sensitivity, and others. I consider damping factor to be one of the, if not the most important spec. Um, Almost all modern amplifiers can achieve a flat frequency response from 20 to 20 kilohertz. That's a gee whiz big deal kind of thing. But the damping factors will be all over the place. And so I've printed out, uh, this, is, um, this is a damping factor of the Yamaha R9 uh, receiver that I'm currently uh, in the process of testing. It has a damping factor of 60. That's respectable. That's good enough. So the question is, how does, and this becomes important later, how does the manufacturer determine this? How is it measured? Well, here's a picture of our amplifier, and here's our load, okay? That's going to be a speaker, it's going to be 8 ohms, we're going to use a dummy, 8 ohm dummy uh, resistor right there. And then this, these are our speaker wires, but when you measure it, you're only going to use very short runs where the the speaker wire resistance is effectively zero ohms. Very short runs, very fat cables. We want to take that wire out of the uh, uh, out of the calculation. So we've got our eight ohm dummy load, and here's our amp that has some kind of mystery. I'm going to call it Z question mark. A mystery internal impedance that we want uh, to measure, an output impedance. Okay, Z out question mark. We don't know what it is yet. So. Uh, the equation, and I've put down a source right here to go to. It's an excellent source. Fantastic. The equation for output impedance, and this is easy to derive. I'm not going to go through the derivation, but it's really straightforward using a voltage divider rule. Z out that we're seeking to find is equal to the resistance of the load times the difference between the voltage no load, that should be no load there, minus voltage load, okay, divided by voltage load. So, the first thing we're going to do, uh, the only thing we need to determine are these Vs. We already know what RL is. That's our 8 ohms. 
So we input some kind of voltage and we're going to pretend that it's uh, uh, 10 volts right there. Uh, we know we have an 8 ohm speaker load. So we, st we start out measuring, we, we disconnect the load right here. Disconnect it and we measure our output and because there's no load and no current flowing out here it'll be 10 volts. So voltage no load will be 10 volts. Um, now, next thing we do is we connect our load, connect it back up. Now current will be flowing through the load, it'll also be flowing through the mystery internal impedance, and so you'll have voltage dropped here and voltage dropped there. So all we need to do is now measure the voltage across the load under loaded conditions, and let's pretend we get 9.5 volts. It's going to be less than the 10 because now there's current flowing and some voltage is going to be dropped internally per the voltage divider. So here's our, our, here's our numbers and here's our equation. The output impedance, okay, we use a voltage divider rule, but, uh, but I could derive this, but we could just use our equation here. The output impedance, Z out, is going to be R load 8, VL uh, voltage no load minus voltage load, that's 10 minus 9.5 is uh, 0.5 right there. And we divide the whole thing by voltage loaded which is 9.5 and we get 0.4 ohms. So this is 0.4 ohms. Now um, <clears throat> 0.4 ohms. Now manufacturers don't usually spec out uh, output impedance because people want to know uh, more about damping factor. Um, damping factor is a number that people can relate to a little more and this goes back in history and the history of audio and that sort of thing. But So, real simple. The equation for damping factor <clears throat> in a situation where you have no resistance on the speaker wires is <clears throat> Z uh, is, is, is a number we use for impedance is the impedance of the speaker divided by the impedance of the amp. That's simple. 8 divided by 0.4 is 20. So 20 is our damping factor for this particular amp. Done. Uh, it's that simple. Now this whole thing was done in a situation where our uh, speaker wires effectively were a zero ohm. Infinitesimally small. But that changes when you... Okay, this is a best case scenario. However, when you get your amp home and you hook it up to your speakers and you've got speaker wires, you no longer have a best case scenario and your damping factor will go down. The question is by how much? Fifty or higher, there's a lot of, there's some debate on, on, uh, in the community about what the damping factor should be, but generally over fifty. Okay, now, let's look at an example where your speaker cables uh, are, well, quite frankly, kind of crappy. Um, but let's start out with uh, how to factor in your speaker cables to the damping factor equation. And keep in mind that in our, you know, in our the previous example we did, we did a theoretical perfect speaker cable where the impedance was zero. However, if this your speaker cable run is long or you have a uh, um, high gauge wire, l uh, small diameter, uh, this cable to the positive will be a resistor. I'm going to call it R cable 1 and the run from the negative back to the amp I'm going to call it R cable 2 and effectively Remember we had, your amp has a built, uh, an inherent uh, Z out. This resistor now becomes Z out plus RC1 plus RC2. So we increase the output impedance, hence we decrease the damping factor according to the resistances of your cable runs. So that having been said, our new damping factor equation for your system with your speaker cables Okay, before it was Z speaker uh, divided by Z amp, but now we have to add to Z amp two times because we have two runs, two runs, 
two times the impedance of a speaker wire. A resistance, basically. We're going to measure a resistance. So that's the new equation we're going to use to determine your system factor, how much you've screwed it up by inserting your speaker cable. <clears throat> now, let's do an example. Sorry about the small tax here, but hopefully you can see it. Okay, the R9, we just talked about, it has a damping factor of 60. So, the first thing we need to do is determine the Z out of the amp, and we already did that. We already ran those numbers, and it's uh, um, uh, the damping, <clears throat> the output impedance, okay, we just ran this, but the damping factor is Z uh, speaker 8 ohms divided by Z amp. So uh, 60 equals 8 ohms divided by Z amp. Z amp is equal to 8 ohms divided by 60, which is 0.13. So we knew that, 0.13. Now we measure, we take, we've got our speaker wire, right? <clears throat> and we take a, a voltmeter, a DVM, and we just do a simple resistance test from end to end. And let's pretend that we get 0.1 ohms. Not unreasonable. One tenth of one ohm. Uh, yes, one tenth of one ohm. Not unreasonable. So let's plug these numbers into our new damping factor equation. And we get 8 divided by 0.13 times 2 times 0.1, blah, blah, blah. We get 24. You can run those numbers yourself. So we started out with a damping factor of 60. And now we're down to 24 because of that 0.1 ohm resistance for each run of the speaker cable. 24 is still respectable. I don't know uh, if any studies have been done, but uh, but still uh, about you know uh, you know the, the audible effects of damping factors when you get down into certain ranges. But still still respectable. But it's not 60. I'd rather have 60. Um, okay, now. Let's pretend you're a real idiot and you're using 20 gauge wire, angel hair basically, over a long run, like, you know, uh, let's say you have 100 feet, you know, your amp is here and your speakers are on the other side of the basement. Ridiculous. And so we now measure with our own meter, you know, we measure with our own meter. from end to end, and we get 1.5 ohms. Quite a bit. It's quite a resistor. And that's just for one wire. There's actually two wires. It's positive and a negative. So let's do the same thing we did before. And um, we know that our speaker is 8 ohms, and we, uh, we know that our Z amp is 0.13. We know that our Z speaker wire is 1.5. So we multiply 1.5 by 2 because we got two runs, one for the positive, one for the negative. We added to the uh, 0.13 from the amp. Uh, we divide into 8, and guess what? Doesn't that look ridiculous? I, I better run those numbers. Something looks wrong. But that's Our damping factor is now 2.5, which I don't, by any standard, that is b really bad news. Okay, we started out with an amp that had 60, but because of our poor choice in speaker cable and or speaker placement so far away from the amp, we have now have a damping factor of 2.5. Uh, your amp speaker wire combination will have no ability to control that those woofers. This woofer is going to do their own thing. You're going to have sloppy, muddy, ridiculous bass. Um, 8 divided by 3.13, 3.13, uh, yes, 2.6. Okay. So we have destroyed a respectable damping sac factor of 60 from the amp itself just by poor choice in speaker cables. Now you're going to want to go measure the uh, um, the resistance of your speaker cables, right? See what they are. If, if you have a good DVM that goes, you know, that, that can, that can, uh, it can resolve or be is precision enough to go down to uh, decimals of ohms. Um, okay, so no base control. Absolute ridiculous. Um, Let's let me hit pause here. Let's try something. Okay. 
So I have um, some very <clears throat> some pretty fat speaker wire here. I don't know the gauge, but it's it's a it's a these are pretty pretty good size. Okay, and I've got uh, I tied the other two ends together, uh, making a total length of roughly 12 feet. Uh, so this should be pretty low. Um, my got my own meter set up. Um, and we have 2.5, point .2, point 0.19, point 0.2, point 0.2 ohms. Um, now you can see, I mean, I, I don't have any crappy cable right now, but you can, you can see where, you know, that's still significant. I mean, point, point 0.2 ohms. Um, one of our examples... see something here. One of the earlier examples assumed uh, point point one ohms. So so we did uh, that's a pretty realistic example right there and it and even that changed the damping factor from 60 to 24. So you can see that, uh, and, and, and by the way, it's not unrealistic for crappy cables to measure over an ohm for long runs and, and small diameters. So, um, so I would say if, uh, if you get out your old voltmeter, or, or your DVM that is, and you uh, put it on uh, uh, resistance or impedance measurements, um, and uh, measure your speaker cables and one direction multiply by two you should be 0.1 ohms or less you start creeping up to 0.5 or uh, forbid uh, one ohm then you know you uh, have major problems and uh, you know and you're no, no doubt hearing uh, some woofers that are out of control so that's kind of the moral of the story um, okay now damping factor uh, we talked about damping factor I'm done with that topic and that's uh, so one of the reasons you want good quality speaker cables that have low resistances and short runs is to maintain a high damping factor of your system to maintain bass control there is another reason and that other reason and this is I find this really interesting and I'm just going to go through this quickly there's some good sources online about this um, that Uh, output impedance, and when I say output impedance, let me just draw this again. And we'll draw the speaker here. The output impedance, meaning your uh, the Z out of your amp plus your uh, Z speaker cables, collectively, added together, <clears throat> directly affects frequency response. And one of the reasons is that we often refer to speakers as 8 ohms or 4 ohms, but if you read carefully, uh, that is what's called a, a nominal <clears throat> number. But in reality, a speaker impedance curve uh, looks like this, or, you know, a, a lot of them, uh, if it's just a single driver, let's say like a woofer, it'll look something like that. But when you add in your crossover network and your mid-range and your tweeter, then you get this complex uh, change in impedance versus frequency. So here we have 20K, here we have 10 hertz. This is impedance right here in ohms, 4, 6, 8, 10, 20, 35. So look at different frequencies. So, you know, down at the lowest frequencies, you know, 10 hertz, we have a 7 ohm speaker, right? Uh, look! Look what happens right here um, at um, uh, somewhere around 40 hertz. We have uh, a 25 ohm speaker. This is where this is the low point, and this is these are the points right here. These low points when you read amplifier reviews and they talk about um, you know the low points being in the base frequencies. When you get a low impedance in the base frequencies, when the most current is 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 required, then you have a difficult to drive load. Um, so here we have uh, an impedance of somewhere around four or five, <clears throat> uh, about five ohms, uh, in, at about 250 hertz. So this is going to require a lot of current, right? But look what happens up here in the voice frequencies. We got a uh, 35 
uh, 35 ohm. So you can't just say an 8 ohm speaker, and this very well may be an 8 ohm nominal speaker. Uh, it's actually more like a 6, 7 ohm, but um, frequency, uh, uh, I should say impedance changes with frequency. Now that, uh, well, let's go in, let's get right into the next next slide, okay? So, and what we're ultimately going to talk about is how a high output impedance, by virtue of crappy speaker cables, changes frequency response of your uh, of your speaker, or of your system of your amp cable speaker combination. Um, so to start that this discussion, let's let's talk about theoretical perfection. Let's talk about a system where you know you have your amp and it's got its built-in uh, output impedance that you can't control. You've got a speaker that has uh, you know its characteristic impedance that you can't control. What you can control is your speaker wire. And let's say you have speaker wire. You know you've got transatlantic cable. You know uh, and, and, and a run of uh, you know you've got speaker wire. That's the diameter, and the run is that long. Okay. In other words, in other words, zero uh, ohms effectively. Uh, infinitesimally small. Okay, that's a perfect world. So let's start out with perfection, uh, theoretical perfection. Um, in this world right here, um, I, let's uh, let's also say uh, I should I should say this too. Let's let's say you have a theoretically perfect amp as well, with no uh, with a zero ohm, uh, effectively uh, output impedance. Well, whatever the voltage. Whatever the voltage coming out of the amp is, is all going to be across the speaker load at all frequencies at all times. So regardless of the frequency, whatever voltage is coming out of here is going to be across that load. None of it is going to be dropped across your speaker cables. None's going to be dropped across your output impedance. So you're going to get the speak the frequency response that you know that your speaker uh, you're going to get a f uh, effectively. Whatever the frequency response of your speaker is, that's what you're going to get. You know, so if you're, you know, when they when you when they do frequency response of speakers, and you know, it kind of looks like that, a little lumpy, a little that. Theoretically, the way it is, that's what you're going to get. Wait, whatever it should be by design, whatever its inherent characteristics are, that's what you're going to get. Because you're not dropping anything uh, on your. Uh, you've got zero ohms resistance between here and the amp. Now what I'm getting to is when you start adding in this resistance, which is so small as to be negligible, but when you start adding in a larger resistance of your speaker cables, this frequency response will change. And it, it could change drastically and dramatically. So how is that the case and why? Okay, we just talked about the ugly looking, not ugly, but the fact that uh, impedance changes with frequency given uh, a certain loudspeaker, uh, its characteristics. So, let's do an example right here. And um, let's say that this speaker right here, okay, this is its curve. Uh, this is its characteristic impedance versus frequency. And let's pluck off two points, just to, to hi, uh, underscore an example here. Let's pluck off two different points. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay, let's um, just to uh, uh, to uh, emphasize the example. Let's pretend what, that uh, we have some crappy speaker wires and that our combination, okay, our our combined output impedance, which is our Z uh, out of the amp plus our Z speakers, okay, is three ohms. That's terrible. It's horrible, but that's what it is. And just to really highlight the point I'm trying to make here. Um, the same thing will happen to a lesser degree if this was 1 ohm or a lesser degree if it's 0.5. It's happening all the time, but it starts to get um, audible. It will be audible in this 3 ohm range. So, so you know, let's just say that, you know, your amplifier is good and your Z out is point, you know, 0.1, but that your speaker wires are terrible and they measure basically 3, 3 ohms. Okay, 1.5 on this run and one point five on that run. Okay, so your speaker wires are dominating the output impedance. Um, okay, now let's look what happens at different frequencies. Let's look at the characteristic, put that aside for a second, 
Now we're looking at the characteristic impedance of a speaker. And let's pluck off two different places right here. Let's pluck off a, uh, a base and let's pluck off a mid-range right here or treble, whatever you want to call it. So right here, let's assume, even though it's not quite on par, but let's assume this impedance is 4 ohms and let's assume that impedance up there is 20 ohms. Okay, 20 and, uh, you know, 4. All right. So clearly these impedances are, uh, one at the base is much lower than this impedance at the uh, mid-range or treble. Okay, let's see what happens. <clears throat> now, almost at the last slide, but this one gets a little complex. So, and here's a source right here. This is an excellent, excellent source to go to to, uh, to read more about this. Okay, so we have... Um, Three ohms hold on a second and we are doing the situation uh, we're going to run the numbers on the situation for uh, um, we're going to start out with the treble or the mid-range 20 ohms so at that particular frequency, our load, our speaker, is 20 ohms. And, of course, our internal impedance is 3 ohms. Okay, that's your crappy speaker cables, basically. Well, we have a voltage divider. So um, um, let's just say that uh, at that point in time, in that situation, the output, uh, the amplifier, is trying to deliver 10 volts. Now, remember, in our perfect scenario where this was zero, all 10 volts will be right across the load just as it should be. However, in our terrible scenario, some of those 10 volts are going to be dropped across the 3 ohm uh, um, uh, in line resistance, and then the some of that voltage will be dropped across the 20. It's a simple voltage divider rule. So the voltage divider rule uh, as applied in, uh, uh, as applied to this scenario will be um, Oh, and the question we want to know is uh, how much how much voltage V question mark will be delivered to our load again because some will be dropped across that awful series resistance so using the voltage divider 10 uh, times in parentheses 20 divided by 23 so it's it's the load it's the voltage we're interested in it's the uh, impedance divided by the total impedance 23 <clears throat> and that will be 8.7 volts <clears throat> so not all the 10 volts was was dropped at that frequency okay across the load so let's now let's compare or contrast with what happens uh, down here in the base region and by the way these frequencies can appear simultaneously you got base at, you know going on at the same time you have mid-range and treble going on so these these things are happening at the same point in time so down in our base or a region, we have uh, at that uh, frequency we have four ohms. We run the same voltage divider. Okay, we have um, we had our ten volts. We have our three ohms. But now at at the base frequencies we have um, a four ohm load. At the same time, well we've got a voltage divider. Except the voltage is going to be divided up differently because the resistors are different and the ratios are different. So if we run that voltage divider, okay, 10 volts divided by the 4 ohms we're interested in, the voltage across that, uh, I'm sorry, times that 4 ohms uh, divided by the total, okay, 4 uh, plus 3, 7, okay, so 10 times that ratio, 5.7 volts. Well, guess what? You now have a disproportionate, okay, you've got... Um, more voltage being dropped, uh, being delivered to the to the speaker at the higher frequency than uh, than you do at the lower. Now, in an ideal world, like we said, in an ideal world um, where this was zero, then all 10 volts would be dropped across our, our our speaker load at the high frequency and all 10 volts at the low. But now you can see at the same period of time, we have a differentiation here, and that's frequency distortion. So if our, let's just say our speaker 
had a theoretically perfect frequency response, which doesn't exist, but let's say it did, right? And in this situation, we had our Z out equals zero, our theoretically perfect amplifier speaker cable combination. Now let's draw that same frequency response so uh, uh, with our, uh, our situation up here, with our three ohm uh, speaker wires. Well, um, and you're going to have, and I'm just going to accentuate things, you're going to have relative to those two frequencies. You're going to have a dip in the base and an accentuation in the mid-range. Uh, and it's significant. Now, this kind of thing, I'm just running, we're just comparing two different uh, frequencies, but this kind of thing will happen at every single point on the curve. And so, uh, you can see that with, uh, once again, the moral of the story is with uh, high resistance speaker wires, you are dramatically, potentially, affecting the frequency response of your amp speaker system, your amp speaker cable system as a system. And so, I find that really interesting. Um, and with that having been said, I would say, and, and uh, others may differ, but if you were to get out your um, ohm meter, if you have a, a good enough quality one, you measure the resistance of your speaker cables, uh, hopefully they're 0.1 ohm per run or less. I would hope for a little less. If you really want, and I'm thinking about doing this actually, if you really want the, I'm going to do this, if you really want the ultimate, um, and I'm, number one, I'm not a believer in high dollar speaker cables, I'm not a believer in crystal alignment of the, of the metals and uh, complex processes and casings and strands and I don't know what the hell they do voodoo, you know, uh, uh, burning incense during the manufacturing process, having a rabbi bless it, I, I'm not into that stuff, man. I buy monster cable, uh, you know, decent quality, but um, and I buy about uh, uh, 12, 12 gauge, I think. Hmm. Um, but I'm going to go measure the cables I'm currently using, um, and I'm going to measure the, uh, and I'll make this, in, I'll do it in part two of this. Nah, I'm not going to do a part two. Well, I'll follow up on it later, but uh, I'm going to measure it. And let's just say I get 0.1 ohms um, or something like that. It might be a little more than that because my runs are about six feet. Nah, it'll be about the same as the one I did earlier. Yeah, okay. No, no, my runs are going to be twice that length of the one I did earlier. Um, so, anyway. Let's say I get 0.1 ohms, and I already know, uh, we already know that that 0.1 ohms changed the damping factor in that previous example significantly, but not down to something that was unacceptable. But what if I take that 12 gauge wire and run like four of them together, you know, and then pinch them off at the end, do some soldering and make a connector, right? Maybe even five. Let's try to get that down to like 0.01 ohms. Something way. Let's let's try to get it down to the point where it, it doesn't affect the damping factor whatsoever. Let me run that number real quick. Okay, let's let's return to this uh, this uh, earlier scenario, uh, which was not a bad scenario, but let's make it better. Um, where where the uh, damping factor of my uh, R9, my Yamaha R9, was 60. Okay, and we initially measured uh, 0.1 ohms, which is reasonable and typical. Uh, for the speaker grow, uh, one run of the speaker wires from, let's say, positive amp to positive uh, terminal of the speaker. And we ran the numbers and it reduced our damping factor from 60 to 24, not bad. Well, what if we were to get, what if we were to get speaker cables that were 0.01 ohms somehow by paralleling a bunch of them together, which I might see if I have enough cable around here to do that. And, um, and uh, what would our damping factor change to? Well, here's the numbers right here. 8 divided by 0.13, we already measured that as the output impedance, uh, not measured it, calculated it as the output impedance of the amp based on the, damp, the spec damping factor. I can actually measure the output impedance directly too. Uh, I'm not going to do that today, but that's easily done. Not on all amps. Some amps you don't want to do it because you don't want a no-load condition. That's a whole other story, but don't try it. Don't try it at home. Um, uh, okay, 0.13 plus 2 times 0.01, and 
Running numbers, we get a 53. So our damping factor uh, with our point is 0, 01, okay, uh, uh, um, an order of magnitude less, um, goes from 60 to 53. Um, and so we maintain almost a full 60. So I'm just curious, because I never was into speaker cables, I'm just curious if I'll notice a difference in sound if I come up with these .01s right here, these speaker cables, if I'll notice a difference in bass response. Now I'm curious, and I think I want to do it, and I think I want to make a video about it. But, let me sum things up here. You know, I was going to make a multi-part, but I think I'm going to, going to wrap this up as a, as a one-part video. Sum things up here. I find that the... Uh, the theory to be interesting. I hope you did too. Um, sorry, I'm speaking fast. I'm trying to do this uh, in, uh, on my break in between work. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of rushing it along. I'm about out of time. Uh, but the moral of the story is uh, keep your uh, resistance of your speaker cables, uh, you know, somewhere in the range of less than 0.1 ohms. Um, you know, that's, I'm just, it's not arbitrary, that's based in what we just discussed, but somewhere in that, in that range. If you were to measure your R speaker to be, you know, one ohm or more, you're in big trouble. Not big trouble, but you're, you're not getting the best, you're not getting the best out of your system, particularly you're in the bass response. Um, and not only that, but, uh, and the last thing I'll say is that, uh, Another thing that's if you have a long run of speaker wire and it's a crappy speaker wire, you're just putting in an inline resistor between your amp and your speaker, and all the power that your amp is uh, delivering is not making it to the speaker. Some of that power is being dissipated in the form of heat in the wire itself. Why would you want that? Um, you don't. A wire doesn't produce sound. So. That's the moral of the story. I hope you found this interesting. And um, this is kind of an impromptu thing I just decided today to put together. Um, sorry, the it's not. I I know I've said this over and over again, but I you know I watch some of these professional videos on YouTube and they're well polished and astonishing and all that. And I, that's not me. I, I can't do it. I prefer to do videos where I'm just sort of speaking to you like you're here. Um, and I don't like scripts and I don't like reading slides. I like. Uh, talking up slides and speaking extemporaneously so hope it was all uh, clear and legible and thanks for watching and I'm going to get back to listening to my R9 um, that I just got off the bench from testing and doing some listening impressions of that and uh, uh, reporting back uh, uh, and, and I believe part three of that series part three or part four I forget thanks for watching and ciao